Just a second. Start recording. Welcome everyone to the fourth lecture of the series uh, by uh, Maher Blanchan. Uh, just one small announcement. We actually created a Slack uh, channel for, for this lecture in case you want to you know, discuss uh, like about the lecture notes or like the homework sets and things like that. Uh, I will post the link on the uh, chat and it's also, also already posted on the um, Institute's website. Like if you go to events web page, you can find it there. Um, and yeah, now I guess we can start Mahi. Thank you. Uh, so um, yesterday I discussed briefly, uh, uh, maybe it was at the end, uh, towards the end, uh, the uh, notion of the weight, um, the, the weight lattice and the uh, fundamental uh, chamber. Uh, so uh, let me briefly uh, remind you the ingredients. Uh, so we had a root system R and we didn't uh, assume that it was reduced or um, indecomposable. Any, any root system that satisfies uh, those three axioms. Um, let's call this the root system. Um, but let's say this is the root system of a reductive group G uh, with respect to a maximal torus. T, and then uh, I'm going to fix a Borel subgroup B that contains T. Uh, so a priori, I don't need this middle guy, right? So B, B doesn't need to appear in order to be able to define the root system. Root system is completely defined in terms of the group G and the maximal torus. If I put uh, B there, uh, this amounts to choosing a set of simple roots. Okay. And then um, from this data, um, if, we, if we list the elements of uh, simple roots as uh, alpha one up to alpha L, um, then, um, uh, then uh, by, by the way, this number little L is the semi-simple rank, um, semi-simple rank of uh, G, meaning that uh, this is equal to the dimension of the maximal torus of the commutator. Max torus uh, of the commutator, which is a semi simple group. Okay, now uh, from, from this data, from these alphas, we define fundamental dominant weights. And um, it is omega one up to omega L. Uh, and um, these are fundamental dominant weights. Um, the way that we defined them was uh, by this uh, pairing. Um, we, we took core roots and we insisted, insisted that these omega i's are um, uh, duals of them. Right, so this was the definition of uh, the fundamental weight. I fundamental weight. Um, now, um, and and uh, the the z span of uh, omegas in um, remember I had this funny notation for the character group. The group of characters uh, I should say uh, z plus span of um, in here, and I'm going to turn this into a vector space by tensoring it with rationals. So this is a pre abelian group um, of um, appropriate rank. Uh, maybe, maybe actually I, I want to use t not here. Um, 
because uh, I want to work with a uh, free abelian group uh, whose rank is, is the number of simple roots. I want these to be the basis uh, vectors. Okay, so now the Z plus uh, span of this is called the fundamental chamber called uh, the fundamental chamber or do dominant chamber. Fund uh, it's called the dominant chamber. Um, and uh, the important thing to know about this uh, uh, chamber is that um, it's a, a strictly convex uh, um, cone and it is uh, generated by these uh, lattice points, omega, so it's a, a strictly convex rational polyhedral cone. So far you haven't used B, right? Uh, B, B used in an essential way. Uh, it is used for defining uh, alphas. Also, oh, it's simple. Don't choose a yeah. simple, it's okay. And, and then uh, choice of simple roots gave us these fundamental weights. Remind me, remind me what simple was again? I forgot already. Uh, simple is a basis for the root system. Basis for the roots. Okay. So uh, remember, uh, the uh, root system has a splitting. Uh, we can always uh, split into two, uh, to positive roots and negative roots. Right. Uh, then um, in here, in S plus, we had these uh, simple roots. Simple, I see. Yeah. And that decomposition is by any hyperplane. Uh, just uh, yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, um, now this is a basis. This is a basis for. Uh, o T zero tensor Q. Um, now, um, uh, so yeah, the girl is uh, crying in the background. I'm sorry, she's <laughs> not. Uh, this is like a little bit of horror movie. Now no. she'll try to get into room. She's forcing the door right now. She I lock the door, but she's going to. Uh, what is it? Yeah. Um, uh, can, excuse me, please. I'm sorry. She may continue uh, a little bit. Uh, okay, uh, so now uh, we have this uh, cone spanned by the uh, omega eyes. Uh, and uh, the, the important thing here is that uh, this, the, this cone, uh, the interior of this cone is the uh, domain of uh, transitivity for the action of the wild group on the weights. So let me uh, write this uh, down. So the wild group of R of this root system, remember this means uh, uh, the group generated by those reflections that I uh, introduced uh, last lecture. Uh, acts on the vector space uh, on the Euclidean vector space uh, uh, T0 tensor uh, Q and um, and the fundamental or dominant chamber is the domain of transitivity, the domain of uh, transitivity 
for this action. So it's a, it's a very uh, instructive exercise uh, to, to work this out. Uh, for SL2, uh, sorry, do it for SL3. Let's, let's take G0 to be SL3. This is a semi-simple uh, algebraic group. Fix the uh, maximal uh, torus as diagonal matrices. Diagonal maximal torus. And uh, consider uh, B to be, uh, maybe I should write B now, upper triangular matrices in SR3. Um, then the uh, explicitly calculate the um, weight lattice. Uh, by this, I mean um, the lattice span by omega i's. This is the, this is the span of uh, z span of uh, omega 1 and omega 2. Omega i's are nothing other than inverses of uh, positive simple rules, right? The duals of positive simple rules. Omega. Uh, omega uh, omegas are defined. Uh, so a way to calculate them is to use this equation. Uh, this. Um, yeah, that's a dual yeah, matrix. Yeah, so, uh, but uh, alpha, alpha j check is two times alpha j divided by. Okay, yeah, very good. Okay, and uh, so explicitly calculate this. Uh, of course, you, you need to determine the simple uh, root system here and then simple roots. We already draw a picture of this uh, before, but uh, this is not the, this is the first easy part. The uh, second part, which is also easy, but it's instructive, very instructive, is to uh, um, calculate uh, the W action um, on uh, on the um, uh, dominant chamber. Uh, by this, I mean just uh, so. Remember, W is generated by S alpha one and S alpha two. Here we have two uh, simple roots, alpha one and alpha two. This is a rank two semi simple group. Uh, calculate the actions of S alpha one and S alpha two on, on the dominant chamber and see where, where they move. Uh, so maybe it's a good idea to calculate all of this S alpha one times S alpha two. Um, and so you need to calculate action of S alpha one, S alpha two. You know, there are six permutations, right? The trivial identity permutation and then S alpha one, S alpha two, S alpha one, S alpha two, S alpha two, S alpha one, and then one more S alpha one, S alpha two, S alpha one. These are all elements, all, all of the elements of the W here. And check, check where these guys uh, move that cone. Um, okay, so, So now, um, how do we, so, so far I introduced these uh, fundamental weights quite uh, um, synthetic, meaning that uh, I define them through combinatorics, right? So they, they, I didn't relate them to the representation theory. So where do they come, how do they appear in the uh, actual representations of the uh, reductive group? Um, so, um, so let me explain this. Um, so let uh, V be a finite dimensional um, rational um, irreducible representation. Of um, let's uh, let's pick G uh, reductive as before connected reductive group. Um, 
Now, um, Mahir, it's a little too dark right now. But. Uh, okay, okay, let me see if this focuses. Okay, okay yeah. yeah. Now, um, the, the problem is it's uh, cloudy here. I mean, this uh, clouds either, of, you know, either sun is coming or they are covering the sun. It's constantly uh, affecting the light. Uh, I see. Yeah. Let me turn the light. <laughs> Now, um, um, so a um, little um, uh, fact here, uh, the, um, so um, the Borasa group, uh, uh, fixes a line in V. Uh, this is a, a, the Lee Colchens theorem. Uh, if a solvable group acts on a vector space, that, uh, there is a line that is fixed by the uh, action. So now, um, uh, maybe uh, I should say uh, stabilizes, not fixing, not, not a point wise fixing. Stabilizes. Uh, Sorry, it's getting like yeah, very right uh, now. Yeah, I have to touch uh, now uh, uh, the button here, which uh, refocuses the camera. Uh, so, um, so what does this mean for us? Uh, this means that uh, the Boras arc would be uh, X on this line because this line is one dimensional. It, it acts on, it's a representation of P at the end of the day. It's a one dimensional vector space. P is acting on it because it stabilizes. Um, it's a linear representation of G restricted to B and B is fixing that line, uh, I mean, stabilizing. Uh, since it's one dimensional, B acts by a character on that uh, one dimensional line. B acts on, let's call this uh, line add uh, by a character. Um, okay. uh, so uh, this means that uh, for every V in add, um, P in B, uh, the action of P in V is given by chi of P V. So it just scales this vector uh, uh, by this uh, number, non-zero uh, complex number. Let me ask you a dumb question. If uh, G is, uh, group G is already semi-simple, B is going to be commutator of G, right? In this case? Uh, no, no. No? Uh, the, the, uh, if, if it is same simple, it's going to be uh, itself, right? I mean, it, it, it will kill the, uh, it will get rid of finite center, but it's, uh, that's it. No, it, it cannot be whole G. I mean, the G. Uh, but if, uh, if you have a simple group, then uh, for instance, it's. A same simple group, uh, same simple. Yeah, but uh, it's the uh, same thing. I mean, not, not of course not the same thing, but it's the finite products of simple groups. Now, so the, what plays the role of B when G is only the same simple? Oh, it, it is a Borel subgroup of G. Yeah, so then it, it Borel becomes, you know, you don't have the diagonals. Uh, uh, oh, reductive. Oh, okay. yeah, so if, if G is reductive, um, take a Borel subgroup B, uh, if you take the commutator of G, then you, you would be, the Boras subgroup of the commutator would be commutator of the Boras subgroup, uh, which is a, a smaller, a smaller Boras subgroup, but it is a Boras subgroup of the semi-simple part. Um, so the, uh, the, there is no essential difference. I mean, of course there is, but, uh, the Boras subgroup of G is related to the Boras subgroup of its commutator by a central torus. 
Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the the only difference is that now. Um, so on this line, uh, we know that the Boral XY uh, character. Um, but uh, yesterday, I mean, I, I didn't get a chance to mention this uh, fact too, but, uh, oh no, actually I did. I did prove this using a Rosanne theorem. Uh, unipotent unipotent uh, groups don't have characters, do not have any non-trivial characters, right? Uh, this was the second uh, lecture, I think. Uh, therefore, if I, if I restrict this uh, Borel subgroup action to its maximal unipotent subgroup, uh, because its character is trivial, it means that it fixes this line. So, uh, this, when I take this Borel, uh, I'm, I'm going to write it this way, ut or tu. The u is the uh, unipotent radical of b, equivalent it's the maximal unipotent normal subgroup in b. Uh, since b is not reductive, it has a maximal normal unipotent subgroup. So I'm taking the maximal one, u. And the maximal torus of B normalizes this, uh, this thing. So I can always decompose a Borel subgroup as a semi-direct product of its unipotent radical and the maximal torus. Now, uh, so in particular, if I take a character here, I can restrict it to uh, U, but it becomes trivial because U doesn't have any non-trivial non characters. So it takes constant, uh, one, constant value one on the unipotent elements. So, in particular, this becomes one, therefore U fixes this line. And, okay, so, um, and uh, all the uh, movement happens by the uh, character of torus. So this is a character of T. So because essentially this also shows that the character lattice of P is equal to character that's of its maximal torus. Now, um, so um, this means, uh, so such vectors have a name. Uh, v is called uh, a B semi invariant. It's not quite invariant, but it, uh, it's semi invariant because B acts by a character. Um, now, um, so now, now let's, <clears throat> let's, of course, I'm going to assume this L to be non-zero. Now, uh, I mean, as far as this line concerned, I could assume it to be zero, but now let's, let's assume that V is non-zero. Okay, so a non-zero vector from this line, uh, it's a B semi invariant. Um, now, um, G, if I hit this vector by V, um, um, this, uh, this orbit in V um, cannot be equal to, um, uh, well, first of all, this is not exactly equal, but uh, this orbit cannot be properly contained in any subspace of V. Otherwise, V wouldn't be irreducible. I see. So, so this has to span whole V. Right? Um, so, um, so it is actually, uh, the span of this thing is the whole thing. But we know that a big chunk of G is fixing this vector V because, uh, uh, one of the things that I, I'm going to tell you today is that uh, uh, the bruja chevalet decomposition it says that we can always decompose our group G, reductive group G, as a disjoint union of unipotent uh, subgroup of the Borel 
some wild group element and the oral subgroup. Um, so because this is a finite set, uh, and so uh, by the way, uh, from here, it's not difficult to show that G, uh, the set U, U times opposite uh, Borel. I also need to tell you about this opposite Borel subgroup. This is dance. That's in, in G. So these are two, uh, two uh, important facts to know about uh, structure of these reductive groups. But this is saying that a unipotent, a maximal unipotent subgroup of P is quite large in G. Uh, and it is fixing this vector. So the whole uh, structure of the uh, irreducible representation is essentially determined by what P minus does to that vector V. You, you did say U is a subgroup of B, right? Unipotent. So U, U, U here is the next radical, unipotent radical of P. It's inside of P, right? Yes, correct. Okay. Unipotent radical of um, B. It's a normal, a maximal normal unipotent subgroup of P. So, um, now, um, so this, this vector, this character of chi, um, therefore, uh, is, is a very special character that uniquely identifies this representation. Uh, this is, uh, of course, this is not the only B weight that appears in, uh, uh, in this representation, but it is the uniqueness property in the sense that uh, its, uh, its eigenvector, V, uh, determines the rest of the representation because G times V is equal to, uh, I mean, it, it spans the whole vector space. So uh, we call this uh, chi the highest weight vector of this representation. Um, maybe um, I, I should say it this way. Uh, the other uh, B weights or T weights equivalently that uh, appear uh, in V um, are uh, all of the form chi minus summation um, alpha i is a simple root um, some uh, coefficients in alpha i is where uh, AIs are um, um, non-negative integers. It's a calculation, uh, but it follows essentially from this uh, this part, because uh, G is um, because this is uh, dance in G. Essentially, uh, other weights are going to be related by the uh, uh, action of the negative. Uh, opposite unipotent radical. Uh, and so we had to subtract their weights from this chi. So they are all less than chi in the partial order that uh, I mentioned at the end of the last lecture. So because of this, chi is the biggest weight, highest weight that can appear with respect to the partial order in, in the set of all weights of this simple representation. So uh, chi is the highest uh, representation or highest weight, sorry, highest weight of uh, V. So because of this, we can denote V by V chi. And also there is another reason that we can uh, do it this way. All the other weights are going to be uh, strictly less than chi. And so if we, if we look at this uh, chi in the uh, fundamental chamber, it, it will, this is a dominant dominant weight, um, and then, uh, like in the case of, uh, for instance, SR three. Um, remember, we had this um, these six vectors, and then um, we had this um, this uh, fundamental chamber here was here. If chi is somewhere over here, 
then all the other weights are going to be uh, uh, contained in the, uh, so let me, I should, I should have started with a clean page. So this is, uh, this is only, a, a, this is not, not an example, but uh, I'm drawing this picture to give you an idea how this uh, thing is related. Two dark. Oh, again. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to pick one chi from here. And then uh, uh, remember um, this domain was the uh, domain of transitivity for the wild group action. And so uh, in this case, wild group is S3, symmetric group on three letters. It has uh, six permutations. So when I hit this guy, I can move it to six, uh, five other points. Uh, so it's going to move down like that. So I am going to get a hexagon here. Uh, um, something like that. And so if I take the convex hull of, of these uh, points that I obtain from chi by hitting down by the wild group elements, these are the vertices, I get a polytop and the uh, all other weights of that irreducible representation uh, corresponds to the uh, lattice points in this uh, polytop. Uh, so lattice points, but with respect to fundamental dominant weights. So uh, I'm looking at the weight lattice, the lattice by Z, uh, remember weight lattice is the uh, essentially character lattice and uh, every uh, character uh, that appears in this polytop is a, a weight of that irreducible representation. However, uh, one thing to be uh, careful about here is that uh, dimension of the irreducible representation is not simply the number of lattice points because uh, maybe, maybe some weights, some lattice points may have uh, higher multiplicities. And so it, it, we may have same, uh, uh, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, even though these weights uh, tells us about the decomposition of our vector space into uh, joint eigenspaces of the T, T uh, eigenvectors, uh, dim dimensions of the eigenspaces might be bigger than one. Anyway, that's a side comment, but uh, the, the thing is that every weight that can appear in V uh, appears as a lattice point in this uh, polytop. Okay. Um, so, um, so now we, so we know that our simple uh, modules or irreducible representations are indexed by uh, dominant weights. Uh, so chi, is a dominant weight, in particular, say, uh, highest weight, okay? And um, so it is a sum, it's a sum, it can be written this way. Some coefficients, AI, omega i's. These are fundamental dominant weights. So this is our uh, omega two here and omega one in here. Okay, um, so we get a uh, nice uh, combinatorial picture out of this uh, representation theory uh, of simple uh, modules of reductive groups. Um, now, um, okay, so I guess uh, I should introduce new notation. So the um, I'm going to denote uh, all of these uh, dominant weights, in other words, weights that appear in here by uh, OB plus. So this is the, uh, the monoid of um, dominant weights. Right, so because this is a cone, 
this region. Uh, it's an uh, it's a semi semi group, but I'm including origin too, so it becomes a, a monoid. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, so now uh, let me move on to um, the fundamental uh, structure theorem, brush the composition, which I already uh, mentioned. So recall that um, the brush the composition decomposition, uh, says that um, uh, any reductive group G can be decomposed into two-sided uh, orbits of its Borel subgroup B. Uh, and there are finitely many such orbits. Uh, and the orbits are parameterized by the elements of the Y. So if I view G as a G cross G variety, so if you view, uh, view G as a G cross G variety, uh, of course, uh, B cross B is a Borel subgroup of this doubled group. Uh, then, um, then the Broas Chevalier decomposition uh, shows that um, G uh, admits an open B cross B orbit. Um, this is because um, be, uh, I have finite the many uh, B cross B orbits here. One of them must be open. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's a, a side comment uh, or fact. Uh, the orbits uh, of a solvable group, a solvable group on a uh, on a fine variety, on an affine variety, uh, are affine. Actually, always affine, but anyway. Uh, so, in particular, these are um, uh, closed, locally closed subsets. Uh, uh, so, we cannot have all of them uh, closed or, or not open. One of them must be dense, in other words. Okay, uh, so this is uh, so this phenomena uh, already is a very special uh, observation. So let's make this definition: uh, a G variety. So G is uh, connected reductive. Uh, I should say an irreducible. Uh, G variety is uh, is called spherical. It's called spherical. It's called a spherical G variety. Uh, if a Borel subgroup of uh, has an open orbit. Um, in X. Okay, so so G is a spherical G cross G variety. In other words, okay. Now, um, um. Uh, I, I want to mention one uh, related fact here. Uh, um, this is actually a fine because it's reductive. It's a spherical fine G cross G variety. The coordinate plane um, um, I, I might be able to prove this uh, soon. The coordinate ring of uh, an affine uh, spherical 
G variety. Of course, this is an infinite dimensional vector space. It's a polynomial ring in general. I mean, um, polynomial algebra. Um, uh, still admits a G action because G acts on the variety X, therefore it acts on the polynomial functions on the variety. Even though it's an infinite dimensional um, vector space, it's locally finite, uh, meaning that uh, we can write it as a, a union direct sum of uh, finite dimensional uh, sub representations. And it happens that if the variety is a spherical variety, a fine variety, then uh, every irreducible appears at most once in this uh, coordinate ring. The coordinate ring of an affine spherical variety is a multiplicity free. Uh, G module. So this means that um, if uh, so, uh, if the multiplicity, uh, so I'm restricting my attention to characteristic zero, by the way. Yeah, uh, characteristic of the field is zero. Um, um, this means that um, if I look at the uh, the dimension of the vector space, uh, these are all uh, G equivalent maps from the, um, the, the irreducible representation whose highest rate is chi, the coordinate ring um, of, of this variety X. Uh, so this dimension actually tells me uh, how many different embeddings of this uh, representation uh, lives in here. Right? The, I'm looking at the G-equivalent uh, maps from my irreducible representation to, the, to this vector space. So this literally, the, this vector space tells me how many different embeddings of this representation in here. So this, this means that it can have at most one uh, dimension. This, this means it's multiplicity free. So same, same irreducible representation cannot occur more than once. We don't need to see all of the irreducible representations, but we know that uh, they can appear uh, at most once. Okay. Um, so uh, we can ask uh, then, uh, what is the coordinate ring of G uh, as a G cross G spherical variety? Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is actually something that we see in uh, basic algebra in, in the undergraduate algebra class when we look at the uh, Maschke's theorem. If you carefully review the proof of uh, Maschke's theorem for finite groups, you see that actually one looks at the uh, um, essentially the set of all functions on the group G and you decompose it into uh, endomorphisms of the irreducible representations of G. So that's, uh, so. Do you have a picture proof of this less than equal to one thing with, uh, with the chamber by looking at the chamber with on BX, KX is less than equal uh, to one. So, it is, I mean, if you want to prove this for all the fine varieties, it's, uh, it is, uh, it's not very simple. I mean, there is, uh, so what, what, I mean, I can only tell you the consequence of this pictorially in some example, but I cannot uh, prove it using the picture. Uh, so, uh, so let, let me, let me uh, draw the picture after writing this down. Okay. So for this, uh, for instance, for our reductive group G, uh, um, we have this picture. So of course, this is nothing but the um, tensor product of this representation, but it's two. 
and this uh, v, v tensor V dual is the uh, homomorphisms from V to V. So this is that. So this is the decomposition of the uh, uh, coordinate ring of an of a uh, of an uh, connect uh, of a affine algebraic group into G cross G or, uh, representations, and this already tells us that if I view this tensor product as a G cross G representation, of course it's irreducible because uh, first factor is irreducible for this, second factor is irreducible for this, so these guys are irreducible representations of G cross G. Uh, now, now we see that uh, in this decomposition, we use all dominant weights of G, but uh, it decomposes into uh, these G cross G representations. So, um, um, so to, to draw a picture here, uh, I guess uh, SR2 cross SR2 uh, would be a, a good example. So let's say this is G cross G, G zero cross G zero. This X on SR2 by two-sided action. Uh, then um, SR2 is a rank one uh, semi-simple group. It's weightless. this is just the um, integers. This is the zero um, where V zero is the oral of SR2. Uh, and irreducible. So this, this part is the uh, uh, dominant cone. And remember, SR2, irreducible SR2 representations are indexed by non-negative integers. Right? So we really see this here. These are positive non-negative integers. This is the dominant cone. Um, then um, if I look at the coordinate ring of SR2, um, therefore um, it's going to be, um, I can now draw a two dimensional picture. Uh, it's going to be, um, so this is Z, this is Z. So this diagonal uh, thing would give me, uh, so these are uh, n comma n in the plane. For each point on this diagonal line, I, I, I have one of these endomorphisms in, in here. Okay, um, any, I mean, uh, let, let me let me uh, move on. Uh, um, I have a lot more to say, so uh, we can discuss this informally later. Um, I wanted to introduce Schubert varieties, but uh, that's that's okay. We can uh, I can come back to them later. I already introduced the weight monoid uh, monoid of uh, dominant weights. Now. Um, okay, so let me let me introduce this uh, now the uh, rank rank group uh, of an arbitrary um, G variety. Um, so um, uh, initially, I will work with an affine group again. Okay, so let um, again um, X be a G variety, be an irreducible. G variety. Um, now, uh, and I will assume that it's affine. Um, therefore, um, the coordinate ring is an integral domain. So um, the rational functions on this variety, therefore, are just a field of quotients uh, of this integral domain. This is it field of rational functions on G, uh, on X. 
um, I know that k of x is already a locally um, finite uh, representation of g, is a locally finite rep of g, infinite dimensional, but it's locally finite. Um, now, um, so if I, uh, so if I take uh, an irreducible G module here, uh, if I take the highest weight of that, it's a B semi invariant in here. So the B semi invariance in K bracket X uh, tells us, uh, tell us about uh, the irreducible uh, sub G modules. Right, they are the highest weights of uh, the irreducible representations of G here. Now, um, so if, so let's take a um, coordinate function F, let's say this is a B semi invariant. I'm going to denote B semi invariants by putting something on top in parentheses. So this is, these are the B semi invariant. B acts on this element by a character. That, that's all it means, notation wise. Um, then, uh, Let's denote the character by chi sub f. So this is the, the character of p uh, that um, stabilizes that uh, by which b acts on f. Uh, so this is the weight weight of this. Uh, semi invariant um, so um, by the way if this is a, a highest weight uh, we cannot have a one over f as a, a in here in general Um, because uh, we don't have rational functions in the coordinate chain. It's an affine, uh, I mean, we cannot invert every element there, right? So in particular, a reciprocal of this uh, uh, semi-invariant may not be there. Uh, by the way, uh, the, because chi sub f is the weight of f, uh, negative chi sub f is the weight of one over f. in additive notation on characters is the weight of one over it. Um, so um, by just focusing on the B semi invariance here, we are missing the reciprocal. So we are ignoring a group like object here. So what we can do is uh, instead of looking at the coordinate ring, we can just study the B induced B action on the rational function. So let's focus on the B representations on, uh, uh, or the B, B semi invariance in uh, the rational functions. So, so uh, looking at the um, uh, semi invariance, B semi invariance of the rational functions uh, is more natural is natural uh, from group viewpoint. So I can, I can look at the B action on the rational functions. Uh, turns out any, any sem B semi invariant here is, a, of course, it's a ratio of uh, two, two B semi invariants from the coordinate ring. Um, and, um, so what I can do now is uh, I can define this uh, map from um, B semi invariance on the field of rational function onto the, um, the character lattice. Right? I can take a B semi invariant and 
attach to it uh, the corresponding weight. And what this does is uh, uh, it defines a group homomorphism. So the map R is a group homomorphism. But by the way, we have about like five minutes uh, till the uh, end of the formal discussion. But today we will continue to stream uh, the informal discussion part of the lecture as well. Okay, sure, sounds good. So now um, I'm going to define the image of this map. Great. Uh, weight group or weight lattice of X. Okay. Um, now, um, and the, uh, because uh, remember, this is a free abelian group. Um, this is indeed, the image of R is indeed uh, a lattice, sub lattice. Let's denote it now by uh, OX, OX uh, is, a, is an honest lattice. It's also free abelian group. It's rank. It's rank uh, uh, is called the rank of the variety G variety X. Okay. All right. So. Um, This is nice. So um, I think um, um, uh, maybe I should give one example, one computation. So uh, for some some important varieties, this is disappointingly uh, simple, but it's uh, actually it's quite interesting too at the same time. So if so, consider uh, G mod B um, as a G variety. Okay, so this is uh, this is our flag variety. Uh, this is uh, spherical because of Brouwer-Chevalier decomposition. Um, so, um, what's the rank, uh, rank of this, the, uh, rank of G mod B is, uh, zero. Um, this is, uh, you can show this, uh, by local uh, computation explicitly, uh, check that uh, indeed um, the image has to be, uh, image of that map R uh, is trivial. Um, in fact, this is true for any subgroup, uh, more generally, if P is any closed subgroup, Uh, such that B is contained in P, uh, then um, rank of G, G mod P is zero. So every, every partial flag variety is rank zero. Uh, and in fact, uh, a theorem uh, that falls out of this uh, study of the rank group 
it says that uh, if uh, the rank and complexity uh, I didn't, uh, I verbally introduced this last lecture. It's the, uh, co it's the minimum co-dimension of a B orbit in the variety. G, uh, G variety is zero, then X is a partial flag variety. This is uh, yet another characterization of the partial flag varieties. Um, okay. Um, now, um, so the natural uh, place to go from here uh, is to look at the, um, now uh, um, some other examples of spherical varieties and calculating the rank uh, rank group or the weight weight group. Uh, um, so uh, now, um, so te technically speaking, one lecture left, right? So tomorrow's lecture. Uh, uh, so m my plan, I keep saying this, that uh, was to introduce toric varieties and then use explain the classification of toric varieties to explain the classification of spherical varieties. In that classification, uh, um, for toric varieties, uh, study of uh, some uh, polyhedral cones in, in, in some Euclidean space uh, is, is sufficient. Uh, for classifying spherical varieties, on the other hand, one needs to introduce uh, invariant valuations and then define uh, colored versions of the fans uh, using those valuations. So, uh, so I'm going to skip uh, classification of toric varieties and uh, tomorrow I will discuss uh, invariant valuations and then um, maybe uh, from there I will explain the uh, fans at the same time. Uh, stating what they are combinatorially is fairly simple. They are very easy to tell, but uh, the real meaning, the real understanding comes after, only after one uh, there's many examples. So, uh, so maybe we can uh, talk about it in, in informally later, uh, maybe after tomorrow's class. So for now, I, I should probably stop uh, instead of starting this valuation con business. Otherwise, it's going to take another 30, 40 minutes uh, formal lecture. Thank you, Mahir. Uh, any uh, questions? How difficult is, is this theorem? Uh, if rank is zero, then it's a caution. Uh, it is, it is really not uh, so difficult. Uh, I think I, I even jot down the, the proof somewhere in the text uh, already. So it's, I think, just one, one paragraph or so. I'm, I'm going to tie, include it in the uh, lecture notes. Okay. Uh, like in, in that picture you drew for um, SL2 cross SL2 acting on SL2, uh, like were, were you saying that, that weights are all, all the only ones, I mean, all the weights are on that diagonal, like they look like n comma n. Yes, uh, those are the weights of SR two cross SR two. Uh, yeah. But but, but the act. Mm -hmm. are these guys. I guess I'm allowing zero to here. Zero is also here, I should say, and, and cross out natural numbers. Like, uh, okay, so, so, but the a a action, like the, the, 
um, the part on the, I mean, the right factor and the left factor can act like using different elements, right? This is not like a, some kind of diagonal action or something. Yes, correct. So SR2 cross SR2 action is uh, indeed. Uh, G comma H acting on X is just G X H inverse. Right. Uh, um, yeah. So like be, because of that, I'm like surprised why uh, I'm, I can't tell why like the, the uh, two sort of components of the weight have to be like the same. Like why can't they be independent as well? Um, um, like, I, I understand, uh, well, uh, but this is, uh, so let, let me offer a hand baby explanation for this. Sure, that sure. Good. So SR2, uh, we're, if we were to look at, uh, I mean, we, we're looking at the diagonal embedding of SR2 in SR2 cross SR2, essentially, and then uh, we're looking at this, uh, quotient is SR2. We are identifying SR2 by this uh, diagonal embedding quotient. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, in some sense, uh, the, the freedom from the second factor is, uh, is getting uh, blocked by this diagonal copy by the quotient. So it almost looks like we have a single copy. Oh. I see. So, uh, mm. I mean, SR2 is, is significantly small compared to SR2 cross SR2, right? That's, uh, yeah. So we shouldn't expect to see all irreducible representations of SR2 cross SR2 there. Right, 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 that, that makes sense, yeah. This is actually Peter uh, uh, algebraic version of Peter Wilde's theorem. This is exactly the the, the composition of the coordinate ring of a group, uh, compact D group, as a representation of uh, SR two cross SR. I mean, uh, as a G cross G manifold. Ah, I didn't say it correct. Uh, the if you look at the uh, space of functions uh, on a compact V group, uh, the L2 functions on a compact V group, this is essentially decomposition of the space into uh, 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 isotopic components as a G cross G manifold. But any other, oh, go ahead. Yeah, that, that, that's it. I didn't want to make uh, oh. Oh. Like any other questions, any further questions? I, uh, I, I'm also like curious about the, um, like, so when, when, you, when you're looking at like, like GMOT B, like the flag variety, mm -hmm. uh, so like in, in general, uh, like if I remember correctly, if, you, if G is like a GLN, yeah. like the, 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 um, the subspaces are like, you, you, I think you get all, all subspaces in the sense that like the dimension between any two sort of consecutive subspaces like has to inc like increase by one, I believe. Oh, that was the, the identification. The concrete. Uh, yeah, yeah, concrete. If, the concrete way to sort of describe it, yeah. In the case of GLN or SLN, uh, you can identify the space by uh, sequences of uh, vector spaces contained in each other. Mm -hmm. This is CN, this is the zero dimensional subspace. VI right. uh, is I dimensional vector space. Um, and we have this container. And they are, of course, proper because dimension is proper containers. Yeah. 
So like uh, in, in yeah, in, in general, if we start with a subgroup of GLN, yeah. uh, like is it easy to tell like what what the dimensions of VIs are going to be like? In, as in like I believe so, like you have sometimes you have to skip some dimensions, but uh, uh, if you take any uh, so uh, take any uh, closed subgroup containing B, so mm -hmm. we, we are looking at this. Now, uh, yeah, that's that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, any such uh, group that contains B is determined by a subset of simple groups. So P is uniquely determined by a subset right. I, and I, I is a subset of this. Um, now, using this set I indices in here, you can uh, exactly determine what, which dimensions uh, that appear there. So it's going to be something like that. Oh, I see. So instead of looking at the full flags, you would be looking at these uh, uh, subspaces that dimension jumps more than one, but but these particular dimensions, these numbers are determined by this set I. Um, either complement, uh, either we have to take, uh, the, there's a combinatorial way of telling exactly what these indices are depending on I. So it is not simple minded thing, take a representation of P and yeah. then uh, intersect that thing with this flag. It's not the corresponding object, uh -huh. something more than that. Um. I try to represent, represent P like the matrix subgroup of GLN and mm -hmm. intersect it that, with that flag. It just doesn't correspond to it is kind of related to it because uh, it is related to it, but it, it's not exactly that. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, the flags are given by. So if you take uh, um, an M by M matrix, so, so it boils down to understanding the matrices that represents the cosets of P here, and then understanding cosets of P. Right. Yeah. Uh, so if you take uh, B, it's this upper triangular subgroup. Uh, these flags essentially can be thought of as uh, taking spans of first vector. This is one dimensional, first two vectors, first three vectors, and so on. And in this one, uh, uh, P, because P contains B, it has to be like bigger staircase shape, something like that. I see. Some subgroup like that. And then essentially it is a similar story, right? So we take first uh, this many of the uh, vectors. So it's going to span maybe I1 dimensional vector space, I2 dimensional vector. So see. together get uh, I1 plus I2 domain. So call this I2 and then call, the, call this one I3 and so on. Let's see. Um, yeah, so, okay. So I, I mentioned that this decomposes into direct sum of endomorphisms of irreducibles for, um, Um, G. Now, uh, this is a G viewed as a G cross G variety. This decomposition is a decomposition of it as a G cross G variety. Uh, so now natural question is whether we could find a, a homogeneous space of G where uh, we could directly get uh, all irreducible representations of G. Right. It's, if you see all of these guys, it's a, let's call it a model, model homogeneous space. Uh, and this happens if uh, H is the unipotent subgroup. 
So G mod U, which is closely related to G mod V, because U is the uh, unipotent radical of B. So this is a T bundle over G mod B, the uh, principal T, T bundle. Um, the uh, coordinate ring of this is a G module. Uh, here, this is the composition is a G, G variety. It, it gives us all irreducible representations of G uh, in the coordinate ring. So you see this uh, unipotent uh, subgroup is very special in the sense that it's a homogeneous space is really giving us uh, all we need for as far as representation theory concerned. This is in some sense uh, related to the proof of that, uh, this Peter Weil theorem because uh, see the coordinate ring of this object turns out this is a, a quasi affine. Um, so the coordinate ring uh, is nothing but the uh, U invariance in the coordinate ring of G. So if I look at the uh, left action of U on here, I would be picking up, uh, I mean, yeah, so uh, indeed, so left, left invariance in here, if I look at the left action of U in here, I would be just picking up a U, U cross uh, or U minus cross U orbits in, in this coordinate ring, I would still catch the same decomposition. Uh, remember, highest weights are precisely the u, u fixed uh, vectors, the irreducible. So if I decompose this into irreducible representations, the highest weights would be u fixed points. Therefore, uh, essentially, I would be looking at u cross u uh, fixed points of this coordinate ring, and it would. The long story short, these two decompositions are. Uh, closely related to each other, they determine each other. And from here, uh, one can uh, even uh, go forward and ask, okay, uh, so we see that this is, uh, this guy is um, nicely decomposed. Uh, we could even say that it's a finitely generated uh, module. Now the question becomes, is it, is it true that for any algebraic variety or any affine algebraic variety, G, uh, affine G variety, irreducible, uh, is the coordinate ring Uh, U invariant star is finitely generated. Because uh, finite generated. this is closely related. This is a closely related question to uh, determining uh, um, basically uh, the U invariance in here is, uh, of course, it's telling us about the decomposition of this coordinate ring as a G, G module. And it turns out this is the case, uh, uh, always true. So for unipotent subgroups, these are all finitely generated rings. Uh, and, um, and this also leads to some connections to uh, toric varieties from here because um, um, essentially, if X is a spherical variety, then uh, uh, modding out by U, uh, we almost get uh, something like a, a toric variety in, in some uh, loose terms. That the, and this would be, in a way, 
um, if it's an affine toric variety, that would be the coordinate ring of the toric variety. But it's so it's it's possible to relate all of these uh, and set up the full circle to relate to toric varieties, spherical varieties together through representation theory. Uh, maybe I should stop actually. We have to take a final exam on this course. Yeah. <laughs> so grading will be 40% uh, homeworks and 60%. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we, we skipped the homework last, last I mean, yesterday. Yeah, uh, I owe you a homework set. Indeed. Yesterday was kind of. Uh, I mean, crazy. of course it's fine. But I, I was sent new homework today. Uh -huh. I, I was still working on the second one yesterday. So. Uh, any, any more questions? Um, okay. I mean, I, I guess we can like uh, stop recording and uh, start. Sure. But,